by the time I got down to the back garden, Jim was already there. Leaning over the fence with a cigarette between his lips, still in his dressing gown, bloodshot eyes staring at me. I barely gave him a second glance at first. I was too focused on my garden. Or rather, what was left of it. I reached up and rubbed my face. I had only just woken and my eyes were still gummed up with sleep. My whole head felt gummed up, foggy like steam-covered glass. I had no idea what time it was, but I knew it had to be early. The sunlight in the sky was weak. I could hardly hear any cars on the main road out the front of the house either. I guessed it was 6am, maybe 7am at the latest. It was a noise that had woken me that morning. A huge, deep rumble, like the sound earthquakes make in films, only closer, much closer. It was as though something had exploded right out the back of my house. And, as it turned out, that wasn't too far from the truth. My back garden is a pretty modest affair. Small patio on the right, little square lawn on the left, a flower bed running along the back. Nothing too glamorous, but it suits me just fine. When I walked out the back door that morning, though, there was barely anything left of it. The entire lawn had vanished. Between the edge of the patio and the fence Jim was currently leaning against, there was nothing but empty space. A giant crater. The hole began a few feet in front of my back door and ended along the edge of the flower bed at the back, probably about three meters in diameter. I could see the roots of my flowers jutting through the crater's far wall. They stretched out of the dirt, flailing at empty air, helpless. Right then, I felt helpless too. Helpless and stunned. I had about a thousand questions rushing through my head, and I didn't know where to start with them. But before I even had a chance, Jim spoke. Looks like you've got yourself a sinkhole there, Simon. I tore my eyes away from the crater and stared at him, watched as he tipped ash from the end of his cigarette. It fell through the air and vanished into the gaping blackness of the hole. Sinkhole. I'd heard the word before on the news. I knew I had. But now, scanning my tired brain for information, I couldn't remember what I'd read about them. Weren't sinkholes something that mainly happened abroad? In countries that had problems with earthquakes and stuff like that? I couldn't remember. The last thing I wanted to do was engage Jim in conversation, but right then, I couldn't see another choice. What the hell's a sinkhole? I said. How did it end up in my garden? I stared at the crater in the ground. From where I was standing, I couldn't see the bottom of it. Its soil-packed walls descended into darkness. A sinkhole, said Jim. Is what happens when you don't take care of your land properly. What's that supposed to mean? It means exactly what it sounds like. You've probably got a pipe leaking beneath the earth or something. Sewage, maybe. Something eroding the ground. You think these things happen by accident? I opened my mouth to give Jim a sharp reply, then stopped myself. The last thing I wanted to do was get into an argument with a miserable old dick. I had bigger things to worry about. Do you know who I call to get something like this sorted? I asked instead. The council, maybe? That, I believe, is your problem. Jim kept his bloodhound eyes locked on mine as he took a final drag on his cigarette, then flicked the butt into my garden. The glowing tip pinwheeled into the darkness of the hole. Just get it sorted, he said. The last thing I want is my home going down in value because you can't look after yours. Jim turned away from the fence, and without making a conscious decision to do so, I found myself yelling after him. Yeah, well the last thing I want advice is from some lonely old dick who can't keep his opinions to himself. I regretted the words as soon as they were out, or at least a part of me did. The other part, the bit that was suddenly burning with anger, didn't regret them one bit. Jim paused with his back to me. After a couple of seconds, he turned around. His red eyes had narrowed into unpleasant slits in his face. 
they were barely visible among the wrinkles. You know what, Simon, he said after a moment. I'm not surprised your wife left you. The only thing that does surprise me is her staying with you as long as she did. I sometimes think about murdering Jim, just putting the old bugger out of his misery. I have a range of fantasies about the different ways I might do it. Sneaking into his house at night and setting up a tripwire across his stairs, bashing his head with a cricket bat, that sort of thing. As I walked back inside my house that day, my mind cycled through them all in deliciously gory detail. I'd never actually do it, of course. I'm not a monster. It's just that lately, since Jane left, I found that my mind needs an outlet, a way of letting go some of the anger I have building up inside me. That anger wasn't helped by the phone calls I had to make that day. It wasn't helped at all. You know what it's like when you ring a company and get stuck on hold for hours? Well, imagine that happening multiple times over and taking up your entire Saturday afternoon. That's how the rest of my day played out. The problem was, I had no idea who to call. I started with a non-emergency police number, but that was a no-go. They told me it wasn't a police issue and made me feel pretty stupid for even thinking it might be. I guess I should have known better, but my head was still in a fog. After that, I tried the Citizens Advice Bureau. They advised me to try my home insurer in case I was covered by them. I wasn't. A Saturday afternoon is obviously not a quiet time to ring up, and I spent close to an hour on hold before some grumpy bloke informed me that sinkhole cover was an optional add-on. Apparently, I hadn't ticked the box. Finally, I tried the local council. They bounced me between departments for a while, before eventually telling me it wasn't a council issue either. If the hole was on my land, it was my issue. They told me to try a landscaper. By that point, it was so late in the afternoon, and I was so ticked off that I decided to call it a day. Told myself I'd have another go in the morning. I ordered in takeaway pizza and got through most of a six pack on the sofa before nodding off sometime after midnight. I had terrible dreams. In one, I was standing in my garden at the edge of the sinkhole, peering down into the depths, only instead of dense blackness, I could see something else down there. Blinking lights. Thousands of them. It felt like I was staring into space. The second dream was even worse, because it felt real. Far too real. I dreamed I was sitting up on the sofa, staring around my dark lounge. A noise had woken me. My TV droned in the background. The volume turned down to a murmur. Weak light spilled from the screen. Shadows danced across the walls. A man stood in the corner of the room. Or at least, I thought it was a man at first. He was right back in the shadows, and I couldn't see his face. I could see his hands, though. Or rather, I could see its hands. Because I quickly realized the thing in my room couldn't possibly be a man after all. No man I'd ever seen before had fingers that long. They hung down just below the knees of the thing standing in the corner. Its palms were very wide and sort of stretched out. Each ended in fingers that were the length of knives. They curved over at the end like talons. I was staring at those hands, hypnotized, when the thing spoke. Outside. Whole. Its voice sounded almost human. Almost. It certainly spoke in English, but the words were so badly distorted it was hard to understand. They sort of gurgled out, like the thing was speaking to me through a mouthful of water. And as I watched, hypnotized, it reached out with one of those nightmare hands and pointed, stretched its fingers in the direction of my back garden. I woke with a start. I was lying on the sofa, my body covered in sweat. For a horrible moment, I struggled to tell whether I was awake or still dreaming. A thick churning fear sat in the bottom of my stomach like a stone. 
my back prickled. It was only after I got up and turned on the lounge light that I felt a tiny bit better, a tiny bit less afraid. But at that point, a different feeling was starting to creep up on me. You know what it's like when someone tells you not to look at something? How all it does is make you want to do the exact opposite of what they've just told you? I started to have that feeling, or at least something similar to that feeling, when I thought about the sinkhole. I suddenly had a nagging urge to go outside and look at the thing, like an itch in the back of my mind. A part of me really didn't want to. That part just wanted to roll over and go back to sleep again. But I couldn't do it. I didn't know if it was a hangover from my nightmares, but I knew I had to go and look. I wouldn't be able to relax until I did. The house was silent as I made my way through it. It was still dark out, and I guessed it had to be early in the morning, maybe 2 or 3 a.m. There was the occasional sound of a car passing on the road out front, but nothing else. By the time I reached the kitchen, my heart was thumping in my chest. My back felt sweaty, despite the nighttime chill, but even though I was afraid, the fear was muted somehow, distant. It was as though I was still half asleep, wandering towards my garden in a dreamlike state. I reached out to flick the switch on for the outside light, then paused. Something in my mind was telling me to leave it off. Let the light from the stars guide you, whispered a voice in my head. That'll be enough. And it was. As soon as I walked out the back door, the night sky bathed me in its soft yellow-white glow. The sinkhole lay in front of me. It stood out clearly, a black circle in the twilight. As I stared at it, I had no expectations. I could feel fear building inside me again, but, for now at least, my dreamlike trance still kept it at bay. In my mind's eye, I saw the shadowy figure from my dream pointing towards the back garden. I heard its gurgling voice saying outside and hole. I walked forwards, my bare feet padded down the concrete steps, then onto the edge of my dew-soaked lawn. There was only a thin sliver of grass left now. Most of the garden had been swallowed up. I stood with my feet on the very edge, toes dangling over the precipice. A warm breeze drifted up from the blackness. I pulled in a deep breath through my nose, catching a smell I couldn't quite place. Then, I looked down. I don't know what I'd been expecting, but it wasn't what I saw. Perhaps a part of my mind was still thinking of the twinkling lights I'd seen in my dreams, winking down in the darkness like cat's eyes. I'm not sure. All I know is that there were no lights in that hole when I looked down. There was only darkness. Darkness. And a ladder. An old wooden ladder fixed to the side of the hole directly below my feet. The rungs going down and down and down. I didn't even have to think about it. As soon as I saw that ladder, I knew I was going down it. The thought made the ball of fear in my stomach shift and churn, but it didn't matter. The curiosity was too strong to resist. Let's get this straight, Simon, whispered a voice in my head. The sinkhole opens up in your garden that's so deep you can't see the bottom, then you have a nightmare about some messed up creature in your house which basically points you in the direction of the hole. And now you're going to follow it? It didn't make sense, but it didn't matter. Right then, sense didn't come into it. The urge I felt inside me was similar to the urge I felt when I woke from my dream. Only now, it was stronger. Now, the only thing that mattered to me was following that ladder to see where it led. Screw it. What do I have to lose? Jane was gone. I was stuck working a job I didn't give a damn about. 
the sinkhole was the only interesting thing that had happened in my life for a long, long time. With that thought fresh in my head, I began to climb. Getting under the ladder was a little awkward. I had to turn around and kneel, then stretch down with one foot, but I managed it in the end. The ladder's wooden rung felt solid beneath me. I'd been worried that it might be rotten, but it wasn't. Although it looked old, it was strong. I took a deep breath, pulled a mouthful of cool night air into my lungs. Then, I began to climb. I took it slow at first. Slow and steady. Right foot down, then right hand, then left foot down and so on. The smell of earth filled my nostrils. Earth and... Something else. Something I couldn't place. It was a sweet, slightly sickly smell. A cross between flowers and overripe fruit. Above me, the stars stood out in a circle of pitch black sky. The light around me was fading fast. When I'd started climbing, I'd been able to see the rungs in front of my face. But they grew dimmer the further down I went. Soon, I was climbing in darkness. I glanced up every so often. The night sky was framed above me in a porthole. Tiny stars winked down at me. By the tenth rung down, those stars were barely visible. By the twentieth, they were completely lost in the gloom. By that point, I was starting to wake. My arms felt numb from supporting my body weight and my hands were sore. Not for the first time that night, a part of me questioned what I was doing. You know who finds a giant hole in the back garden, then decides to climb down into it? Whispered the voice in my mind. Crazy people, that's who. People who have completely lost their grip on reality. But the thing was, I didn't feel crazy. I felt alive. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my adrenaline was pumping. The fear still sat in my stomach, but that was okay too. The fear only added to it. I felt like a little kid again, sneaking downstairs at night to steal food from the kitchen, like I was on an adventure. This thought process broke off when I sensed the change around me. I had to be about 30 rungs down by this point, and something had happened to my surroundings. Some subtle alteration I couldn't immediately work out. I stared ahead at my hands on the ladder, concentrating, and then it came to me. My hands. I couldn't see them again. They were illuminated by the very faintest tinge of pink light. I stared around myself, trying to work out where the light was coming from, scanning the hole's earthy walls for a source. That was when I saw the first of them. A little below me on the right, growing out of the earth, reddish pink in the gloom. Flowers. They weren't any species I recognized. I'm not exactly an expert, but I know my way around a garden. The things growing out of the wall were like nothing I'd ever seen before. Even in the pink tinged shadows, they looked strange. Their leaves were spiky and long. They seemed to pulse in the darkness. And it was probably just my imagination. But as I gazed at the one closest to me, it seemed to move like it was reaching out towards me. I kept climbing. I could feel the fear in my stomach, but it was balanced out by a strange sense of excitement, a feeling of discovery. By the time I was 40 rungs down, the flowers were everywhere. Pink light filled a tunnel. Scenting I might be nearing the bottom, I ignored the pain in my arms and picked up my pace. That was when something strange began to happen. The further down I went, the more my sense of balance shifted. I started to feel almost weightless. It was like I was crawling backwards rather than climbing down. I know how that sounds weird, but I don't know how else to describe it. 
By this point, the flowers are pushing their way between the rungs of the ladders. The petals brush my arms and legs. The spiky leaves stretched out towards my face. My arms suddenly felt weird. They hadn't stopped aching, but now they were aching in a different way. I'm not a big gym goer, but I occasionally force myself to do some press-ups in the morning. Right then, my arms and chest felt like they did after one of those sessions, like I was pushing my body weight up, away from the ladder, rather than supporting myself by clinging to it. It was the oddest, most disorientating feeling I'd ever experienced in my life. A few rungs later, I realized I wasn't going to be able to support myself for much longer. My arms were shaking. Each time I let go of the ladder with one arm, the other felt close to collapse. Panic filled my mind. In a desperate bid to stop myself falling, I pressed my body as close to the wooden rungs as I could. The flowers tickled my exposed skin. I felt my body weight rest against the ladder. And then, quite suddenly, I felt it taking my weight, supporting me. Tentatively, I let go with one hand. No change. The feeling of gravity trying to pull me down into the sinkhole had stopped. Ever so slowly, loosening one finger at a time, I let go with my other hand. I kept my eyes screwed shut the whole time, but nothing happened. Contrary to everything I knew about physics, I didn't fall, screaming into the abyss. My body stayed exactly where it was. The realization of what had happened to me came slowly. I lay on the ladder, trembling, unable to believe it. But the thought I'd had earlier, that feeling of crawling backwards rather than climbing down, was the only thing that made sense. After several minutes of lying prone on the ladder, I worked up the courage to test my theory. I stood up. I got my trembling hands under me, and I pushed myself into a standing position. I stood with my feet planted on either side of the ladder. Gravity had shifted. I didn't know if it had happened gradually or suddenly, but at some point during my climb, the world had rotated. Now, the flower-strewn ladder was beneath me, lying among the pink growth like a path. The sinkhole had become a tunnel. Slowly, feeling a tightness in my chest, I turned around. I turned so that I was facing in the direction I'd been climbing, facing what I'd previously thought of as a hole. It extended away into infinity, just went on and on and on, faded into a reddish pink pinprick in the distance. Aside from the plants climbing the walls like blood soaked ivy, there was nothing else to see. Or rather, there was almost nothing else. Over to my left, a few feet in front of me, my eyes picked out a shape against the tunnel wall. A strange mound among the flowers, a sort of lumpy bulge. I walked over to it. By this point, it almost felt like my body was operating independently from my brain, running on autopilot, as though I'd stepped out of the real world and straight into a dream. The flowers pulsed and glowed in front of me. They were growing thick here. This particular section of tunnel wall was swamped in them. They crawled over its surface like vines. But they weren't thick enough to completely hide the thing beneath. As I reached out to part the flowers, I noticed my hand was shaking. The fear I'd felt on and off since waking had returned in full force. For the first time since entering the sinkhole, I was suddenly aware of how warm it was down here. My skin felt clammy. The sickly sweet smell of the flowers invaded my nostrils. I took a breath and pushed them apart and saw a hint of grey underneath. I pulled in another breath and reached up higher, forcing the flowers apart again. More grey beneath some kind of soft material by the looks of things. I pulled my hand back and reached higher still, to the round, lumpy shape at the very top, the bulge that was roughly level with my own head. I parted the flowers once more, 
and found myself staring at a closed human eye. I nearly screamed. The only reason I didn't was because I bit down on my lip hard to stop myself. There was a person beneath the flowers. A damn person. The plants had swarmed over them to make a cocoon. Without thinking, I started ripping the flowers from the wall in chunks, tearing them out of the soil. They felt warm in my hands, but I hardly noticed. I was intent on freeing whoever was trapped underneath. As I was doing this, a distant part of my mind became aware of some background change in the tunnel. A kind of vibration I could feel in my teeth. A faint tremble in the earth. But I ignored it and kept ripping at the blood red plants. Sweat ran down my face in warm trickles. My heart beat hard in my chest. I didn't stop until I cleared the flowers from the person's face. I didn't stop until I realized, quite suddenly, that the man bound to the tunnel was someone I knew. I stepped back, stunned. It was my neighbor, Jim. His head was tilted down, so his chin touched against his chest. His breath wheezed in and out in ragged gasps. I stared at him in shock for a moment, unsure what to do next. Then, his eyes suddenly snapped open. I stumbled back a step, my foot caught against the ladder, but I managed to keep my balance. A look of animal terror filled Jim's bloodshot eyes. He stared at me as though he'd never seen me before in his life. Then, he started yelling. What did you do? Jim's voice was gravelly from years of smoking. It sounded like he was screaming through mouthfuls of dirt. What the hell did you do, Simon? The vibration in the tunnel had grown worse. The floor was trembling beneath us now. Jim stared around wildly, looking for an escape route. The mass of flowers covering him trembled and shifted as he thrashed against them. But it was no good. They held him fast. Let go of me! He screamed. Get this mess off me! I opened my mouth to tell him I had nothing to do with the plants, that I was just as confused as he was. But I didn't get a chance. Because just then, I sensed movement to my right. A shadow in the tunnel. My head snapped around in its direction. And suddenly, I was screaming too. The creature from my nightmare stood in front of me, the one I'd seen in my lounge. It was only a few feet away, lurking in the blood-red shadows, watching us. Or at least, I assumed it was watching us. The thing didn't have eyes. It was roughly the shape of a person, but the bit that should have been its head was completely smooth. No hair, no nose, no mouth. It took a step forwards. In the shadows of my lounge earlier, it had appeared grey in colour. Now I saw it was blue. A very dark blue, like the deepest part of the ocean. It was like a painted statue that had been smoothed to a texture close to glass. Its body pulsed with light, just like the flowers. And its hands. Looking at those hands made my skin crawl. They seemed even longer now than they had appeared in my dream. Longer and sharper. The fingers were so elongated they almost scraped against the tunnel's dirt floor. The earth around us shook. The vibration shot through my legs like an electrical current. Dirt fell from the ceiling. Jim screamed and yelled, his shouts almost lost in the noise. Choose. That gurgling voice. The same one I'd heard in my nightmare. I heard it again then in the tunnel, only this time it wasn't speaking out loud, now I seemed to be hearing it in my head. I stared from the creature to Jim, my heart hammering. Choose. The voice was more urgent this time. On the walls around us I saw red flowers being shaken loose from the dirt, uprooted. Some fell to the floor of the tunnel where they died instantly, their lights winking out as they hit the ground. 
Dirt drained out of my hair and in my eyes. Jim screamed. And I made a choice. I made it by not saying anything, but by simply backing away, retreating down the tunnel. I had a nasty moment where my heel snagged against the rung of the ladder and I nearly fell, but I just managed to stay on my feet. The last thing I saw before I turned and ran was Jim stumbling free from his cocoon. The flowers binding him had loosened and fallen away as the ground around him shook. He wobbled forwards into the tunnel, his legs buckling beneath him. The creature caught him. It caught him with one of its long, spider-like hands. It supported his body to stop him falling, holding him up like an adult might hold a child. And then, it lifted its other hand and pushed the pointer finger into his mouth. I made it out. The tunnel crumbled around me as I first crawled, then climbed to the surface. But I made it in the end. I made it back into the cold night air of my garden. Jim didn't. I don't know exactly what happened to him down there, but I know one thing for certain. He's not around anymore. My neighbor's gone for good. I'd only just climbed free of the sinkhole when the thing collapsed behind me. When it fell in on itself, I lay on the edge of the chasm, panting and watching as the ladder shook free of the dirt wall, holding it in place. I watched the wood crack and then fall into the abyss. Then I stared on in awe as the dirt walls caved in entirely. The whole thing was over in a matter of seconds. After it was done, I half crawled, half stumbled upstairs to bed. That night, I dreamed again. It was similar to the nightmare I'd had before, only with one key difference. This time, the thing in the shadows of my bedroom wasn't the creature. It was Jim. Jim staring at me with bloodshot eyes. Jim screaming. Jim asking me, over and over, what did you do? I try not to think about Jim anymore. There are a lot of things I try not to think about. I don't like to dwell, for instance, on how little I care that he's gone. Neither do I like to remember the little thrill of excitement I felt when I was down in the hole with him. That excitement feels wrong now, somehow. Unnatural. And... There are certain little inconsistencies from the night itself I don't like to think too much about either. Inconsistencies like my clothes. Despite the fact I'd been underground, and despite the fact I remembered soil falling down on me, my clothes weren't nearly as dirty as I'd have expected. When I picked them up to put them in the washing machine the next morning, it was really only the bottom of my jeans that had mud on them. The shovel was strange too. The next morning, I went straight out and bought a boatload of soil bags from home base, intent on filling what remained of the collapsed hole. When I got back to the house, though, I couldn't find my shovel. It wasn't in its usual spot. It was only when I went out to the garden to dump the soil bags that I saw it. It was lying by the edge of the sinkhole, as if I'd already used it for something. I couldn't remember putting it there, but I suppose I must have done. I just don't remember when. The last strange thing happened when I was filling in the remainder of the sinkhole. Since it had collapsed in on itself the night before, it was no longer that deep, only a few feet. I didn't understand how that was possible, given how deep it had been originally. But it didn't matter. The proof was right before my eyes. The hole was now shallow enough for me to see the churned earth at the bottom but it was still deep enough to make me work up a sweat. As I shoveled in pile after pile of soil, I felt moisture trickling down my back. My heart thumped in my chest, and as my ears were ringing and the soil was raining down into the hole, I thought I heard Jim's voice. Very, very faint, as though it was coming from beneath the ground. A cry for help. My heart started beating faster, but I told myself I was hearing things. 
Had to be. My exhausted mind was playing tricks on me. That was all. I shook my head and shoveled the soil more quickly. Hours later, when I was finally done, I went inside and opened a beer. Opened a few beers, actually. The more I drank, the easier it was to forget about Jim. The easier it was to forget about him, lying beneath the earth in my back garden. He was a miserable bugger, but he didn't deserve that. No one does. And I don't deserve to keep turning it over in my mind either. The thing's done now. I've been through a lot too. I might be the only one who made it out of that hole alive, but I still have to carry the memories. And the last thing I want to do is examine them too closely. Everything begins with a red door. We knock. I straighten my collar. I pull up my pants. Jenny gestures wildly at my zipper. That zipper. And I realize with horror. Damn, the fly is open. I fight wildly to get it in place. Sweat builds on my brow. The white hot valley sun beats down on my back like we're stuck in the Caribbean. And the fabric is stuck. Of course the fabric is stuck. The fabric always gets stuck. They make these goddamn pants just to get stuck on a schmuck like me. The zipper is caught in my boxes. I'm pulling. Jenna tries to help. She's making it worse. Stop making it worse. The red door opens before we have the chance to fix it. And then, I'm standing there, with my hands on my crutch, and my girlfriend's hands there too. Her parents stare blankly ahead. The holidays are a stressful time for everybody. We laughed it off, and we step into the kitchen. I go in for the handshake. Jenny says it's better to shake hands when meeting people for the first time. You have to keep boundaries, Matty. People respect boundaries. Mr. Weber had a firm grip. He is the type of man to look you in the eyes when he does it. Mrs. Weber's handshake is dainty and petite. She asks if I prefer tea or coffee, and I say, Tea, Regina, please. Coffee makes me jittery. We sit down at the oval kitchen table. Roger wants to know my occupation. He is a professor just to pay the bills, you know. But it's independent study which intrigues him the most. White Valley University keeps their checkbooks open when it comes to research. He hired two new interns just this past fall, and you would not believe the things these kids uncover in the lab. Mind-blowing stuff, Matt. Really world-altering stuff. So, what are your passions? Roger asks, in the crooked way only a concerned father could ask. Where do you see yourself in five years? I tell him about my company. Dynatap may be a small fish in the big market, but we have growth potential. Just this week, we received a report which stated that 3,000 people use our program daily. The free version of our app is booming, but we are working on a solution to move folks into paid subscriptions. I believe our next product will accomplish this goal. Oh? Roger murmurs skeptically. And what is the name of this product? I leap to tell him the name. I know the name. Of course I know the name. I live this product. I breathe this product. It consumes every inch of my life. I plaster the name throughout thousands of lines of code again and again, working night after night just to get it right. This product is my baby. My future kids will know its name. Why the hell can't I just remember the name? Just say the name, doofus. The man is waiting. I have to check my notes. Jenny laughs nervously. Regina looks on in despair. Roger is angry now. Not good, Matty. Not good. Jenny said to never make Roger angry. You created a product that would change your company's future, he huffs quietly, and you can't even remember the name? Think, think, think. Roger is getting out of his chair now. Why would he get up? Oh God, we're in a booth. There's not a lot of room. I have to move just to get out of the way. 
The kitchen table is shaking. Oh God, he's mad. Jenny said to never make Roger mad. Think, think, think. Think, Duvas. Think, Vest. Roger pauses. He sits back down. He lets loose a smile full of crooked teeth and thinning gums. Regina smiles too. She brushes back a tendril of styled hair and sets down the tea, three sugars, before sliding next to me. Regina wants to know about my mother. Regina says a good man always looks after mom. My mother lives over on Andover Street, Mrs. Weber, I say, and I'm sure she would love to meet you too. Regina, please. Roger jumps back in. Roger wants to know more about the product. He loves tech projects. He loves the name. He loves the concept. I talk for hours about online banking capability, microtransactions, and minimum fees. Dinner comes and goes. Dessert does too. Roger is interested. Roger is impressed. He worked on Wall Street, you know just for a little bit. Not everybody can hack it with those big number boys. Soon enough, my glass gets empty, and Roger is rushing to fill it with more beer. Good beer. The quality stuff. Think fair stay. He gushes through a mouthful of high alcohol content IPA. Think vest. Couldn't have said it better myself. Jenny floats back to the table. She and her mother just finished the dishes. She's got the sleeves of that blue dress pulled up now. And dear God, she's a vision. She slides down into my lap with an arm draped around my shoulder, in the angelic sort of way women do, with black bangs dripping over light hazel eyes. The sleeves of her dress slips up, and she kisses my cheek, and my mind wanders to a place it shouldn't wander. She asks if, You boys are done in here? as Roger lights up the butt of an already used cigar. Seems like you got a hell of a guy here, he mumbles. One last question. I nod. Roger likes a curt nod. What the hell do you want with my daughter? I laugh. Jenny laughs and slugs his shoulder. I look down in humility. I feel like I know Roger now. I feel like I know what he wants to hear. I know what any father would want to hear. I love her. I look him in the eyes when I say it. And I want to marry her one day. Roger smiles. Well, okay then. The evening ends with a vintage bottle of wine. 1983. The good stuff. Jenny looks giddy as a teenager in a little blue dress. She smirks with a giggle and shucks off the shoulder strap slowly. SpongeBob bedsheets smile back at us unabashedly from the top of a tiny little twin. Pictures of pop culture icons and articles about a dad decorated the walls. A mirror reflects any teenage boy's dream. You passed, she purrs. You finally passed. She pounces into my arms. Her perfume dances through my nose like candy. She pulls me into the soft spot, between her neck and her shoulder blades, and I've discovered peace. Pure, unadulterated peace. I want to stay in that peace forever. Nothing would make me happier than staying here forever. But the lights go out, and the world turns to black. I wake up sometime after two in the morning. The house is dark. Jenny sniffles from the slightly far side of the bed. Roger snores from down the hall. Somebody tosses and turns. Probably Regina. But I don't care if she's close to waking up. She can wake up if she down one wants to. Because I need water. God damn am I thirsty. Why am I so thirsty? I get up and curse the creaking bed as my soft feet shuffle quietly across the cold wood floor. The staircase has two creaking stairs, and I don't know why I remember that, but I do, and I avoid them perfectly on my silent descent into the kitchen. I hit the light. The refrigerator has one of those water filters built inside. 
paper cups are in the cabinet. Nobody will even notice. There won't be any dishes. I'll just grab some blissfully cold water and sneak back upstairs to my beautiful Jenny. But then, something clatters in the basement. At first, I pretend I don't hear it. Probably just a Christmas box. Maybe the storm started early. Maybe the wind got inside. But then the clatter rings again, and again, and again. And it's getting to the point where I have to see what it is. What the hell could it be? Jenny never said anything about a pet. Jenny never said anything about mice or rats, or any other critters living in that house, let alone the basement. But that sure as hell sounds like something living, because I can hear it shaking now. Did it speak? Thought I heard somebody speak. I peek down the basement corridor. I step down. The stairs are carpeted and protected from my horrible creaking. It's dark. Too dark to see. I pull out my cell. The damn thing doesn't work. Ever since we got inside, but the flashlight still should. I step down again. I fumble for the button and point the phone toward the spot in the corner that's making all that damn noise. And then, I'm looking at myself. I'm staring at an exact replica of me. I don't know how else to describe it. It's me. I'm chained to a wall. I'm wearing a business suit. My tie is a little crooked and green, contrary to my current red, but the outfit is otherwise similar. Black shoes, black belt, white shirt, a red bruise ripens my forehead in the corner by my temple, and blood leaks slowly from the center. Run, he says to me. Get the hell out of here. I turn the flashlight around the basement, and my breath stops. My heart pounds. A dozen versions of me decorate the basement wall like trophies. There's a version of me with broad shorts. There's a version of me with a crew-cut haircut. There's a version of me with a man bun and a damn mean shirt. And then there's a version of me with a tuxedo. All of them are chained up and blooded. All of them are dead. Each of them is more decayed than the last, with throat gashes, bruises, and eyes blacker than the fish my father used to catch on his old boat with barnacles. What's dead is dead, Matty, he used to say. Don't spend time looking for the dead. Run, Green Tie cries with thinning teeth. They're going to wake up. Sure as hell, he's right. I'm right. We're both right. We're all right. Roger isn't snoring anymore. That's not good. Roger always snores at night. If he's not snoring, then... Jenny is awake, and Regina's probably not far behind. Roger keeps a gun in the safe and plies in the kitchen. Not good, Matty. Not good. The door upstairs open. It closes with a bang. The window, I say to myself. Now. I'm running across the basement. I'm pulling desperately at the clasp. It's stuck, of course. The damn thing is always stuck. They make these windows just to get stuck in a schmuck like me. Roger is walking into the kitchen now. Not good, Matty. Not good. He'll have the pliers soon. I can hear him cursing to Regina. Not good, sweetie. Not good. The clasp breaks free. I can't believe it. The wailing wall breaks, and a breath of fresh air pours in over my brow. Roger is at the door now. Green Tide tries to distract him. I leap up, sneak my fat butt through the narrow space. The fresh air feels so good. I don't remember it feeling so good. The night sky looks so beautiful. I don't remember it looking so beautiful. There's a struggle in the basement. Curses and shouting rip through an otherwise silent night. Roger rushes up the stairs. He stumbles outside. He rushes and fumbles for the keys while getting into his car. But he is too late. Too, too late. Because I am gone. 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 It took a lot to try and start my life over. I moved out of state. I found a new job and a new name and a new apartment. I lived on my own, away from people. 
and I tried to put Jenny and her crazy damn family behind me, even if I still dreamed about her all the time. I want more than anything to go back to the person from before. I want to go back to the person who sat underneath his father's boat for hours and cleaned the barnacles. I want to go back to listening to his stories. But one day, it occurred to me, after a long time spent dwelling, the facts of my life are only that. Facts. I can't hear their voices anymore. I can't see their faces anymore. It occurred to me that I can't truly remember anything anymore. Everything in my life begins with the red door. I must have been six when I first saw the masked troop. Yeah, it had to be six. My mum and I were walking home from kindergarten and she was asking me what I wanted for dinner. I probably said something like mac and cheese or McDonald's, because that's not important. Because it was then we passed the performers. They'd monopolised an entire corner of the nearby park and attracted quite a crowd. My mother was definitely familiar with them, with how she grinned from ear to ear and clapped. Oh, they're back! They're finally back! Tommy, look at the people with the masks! And by God, there was an assortment of masks. Animal masks, ranging from tiger to mouse, along with some more human-appearing ones. Currently, a zebra was reading out some sort of dramatic monologue, while a white lady mask seemed to dab away at non-existent tears on her cheeks. It all came to an end when the tiger bowled the zebra over, and the two had a mock wrestling match that ended with the zebra pulling the tiger's arm behind his back and not releasing it until the tiger cried out uncle. The masks weren't made of any kind of plastic or leather. They were made from wood. They were incredibly detailed and ornate. The actors, just tilting their heads in a slightly different position, would entirely change their expression from sad to glad to mad. Yes, the animal ones too. It didn't really have my attention, so much as my mom, who was filled with childlike glee. At the end of the show, she took me up to one of the male actors. He wore one of the human masks, meant to appear as some kind of king, judging by the gold crown on the mask's forehead. I'm sure words were exchanged between my mom and the actor, but I was more distracted by the actors loading up a van with all their props. Not their masks though. No, they kept those on. But what really got my attention was the girl sitting in the passenger seat of the van. She was skinny, her stringy hair hanging crookedly by her shoulders, almost like she cut it herself. Our eyes met and she just seemed sad. I wanted to go up and say hi to her, but right before I was about to, my mum gently pushed me forward towards the king. The king knelt down to my level and took my hand. I couldn't tell if he was happy to see me or not, but he squeezed my hand tightly before standing and walking back to the van. They all piled in the back and the van drove away with the little girl. I never once exchanged words with her, but the memory of her sitting all alone in the passenger seat was burned into my mind. My mother passed away shortly afterwards. She was always troubled, so although my grandmother insisted it was just an accident, I have a feeling she purposefully jumped in front of the train that took her life. I lived with my grandmother after that. She was strict, and honestly, I was glad when I turned 18 a few months back and could finally get the hell out of her house. I moved back to my hometown. I reconnected with a lot of my childhood friends, managed to find a cheap apartment and a decent job while I scraped up the cash to maybe one day go to college. It was starting to rain when I saw the troop again. It was the tiger and the zebra setting up a small stage in the park. I hadn't thought about the masked troop in so long, but seeing them again made those memories flash back to the forefront of my mind. 
without even realising it, I was walking to the park, standing in front of the stage. I could almost feel my mum's hand in mine again, remember the warm, autumn sun on my face. I felt eyes on me, and I turned around to see another one of the actors. Another human-faced mask, but this one gave off the feel of a porcelain doll with rosy cheeks and ruby-painted lips. But somehow, I just knew that gaze on me. I'm sorry, this is weird, but have you been with this group since you were a kid? God, I felt awkward asking, but I had to know. The girl cocked her head to the side before nodding once. I think I saw you then, sitting in the small van. You probably don't remember me. She took my hand and she shook her head before gesturing to the spot next to me, tugging at her hair afterwards. It took me a second to realise what she meant. You remember my mom? I asked, breathlessly. The mask might have hid her expression, but I could feel her smile. She died about a month or so after that. The girl stood still, before bowing her head in respect. With that, she reached into a pocket and pulled out a notebook, scrawling out two words before turning it to me. Sorry, Ceres. She quickly wadded up the paper and threw it away, it bouncing off the ground. It took me a second to realise what she meant. Ceres, is that your name? I asked. She nodded again and took my hand in hers. We walked together until we ended up at a nearby cafe where two other masked actors were, the lion and the rabbit. It was then I realised each of the masks had a slit where the mouth was, just large enough to allow them to eat. That was just the beginning of my discoveries about the masked troupe. For one thing, they never spoke off stage occasionally using hand gestures to indicate what they wanted. If that didn't do it, Ceres would write down one or two words on a piece of paper before throwing it away as fast as she could. Yes, they could speak, but it seemed it was not something they did outside of their shows. Ceres ordered me a hot cocoa and listened to me talk about how my life had been going since my mom passed. She tugged at a friend's clothes and drew a line across her forehead. Somehow, that was enough for them to understand that I once saw their show and they ended up buying me a dozen pastries to take home. When I left, she wrote down her phone number on my hand before hurrying over to the stage that was now set up. I stuck around to catch a glimpse of the show, figuring I'd head home after an act or two. I stayed for the whole thing. There were skits, plays, jokes, and Sarah's song. And when she sung, I think the world stopped for a second. All I could hear was her. Her beautiful voice, clear as crystal. I think it's pretty obvious by now that I immediately got a crush on Ceres. She was just amazing. We hung out whenever I had a free moment and I went to every performance I could. On my nights off, Ceres would invite me to go drink with the troupe. They'd buy all my drinks, and I'd learn quickly enough if I wanted one of their attention. I'd just basically call out whatever their mask is. It'd get their attention at least. I'm not sure how many people are a part of it, but it's a lot more than I thought. I approximated maybe six. I think there's easily almost 40 people a part of the mask troupe. Each person has their own unique mask, and they never take them off. They're easy to spot around town, I'll tell you that much. They also don't like people recording or photographing their shows. If they catch you, and by God, they have a radar for it, all the actors go immediately silent and turn to face the opposite direction. They won't continue until the camera or phone is put away. I tried once recording Ceres by putting my phone in my bag and turning on record, and somehow, they still figured it out. She was pretty ticked at me for a while, and make all the silent treatment jokes you want. I felt pretty bad. I promised never to try that again. 
I made friends with them. They were different, but that was their way of life. After some digging, I came to find out they've been coming here every few years since the 60s. It's why people don't really give a damn when they show up, I guess. It's just... normal. But they're not normal. I knew something was always different. After all, people who always hide behind a mask have something more to hide than their face. I'll tell you that. Although most of the town was cool with them, there were a few hecklers, a few whispers about how damn creepy the mask troop was. One night, I was heading back from work when I saw a few of the troop, Ceres, Tiger, Rabbit and Doe, a tall woman with a deer mask who always told jokes on stage. I was about to call out to them and say hello when I saw they were in a hurry to get away from someone. Someone who was drunk as hell and being the worst kind of drunk as well. If he wasn't saying some sort of lewd comment to Ceres or Doe, he was calling them freaks or weirdos. It came to a head when he grabbed Rabbit by one of her ears, yanking her down. She didn't make a sound as she attempted to squirm herself free. But Tiger grabbed the drunk's arm and yanked it away. The women all hid behind Tiger, who might have been getting old, but he was still one big guy. Did you bloody touch me? The drunk slurred. And it was only then I saw the bottle in his hand. Screw you, you creep. He brought down the bottle on Tiger's head, breaking it. Tiger went down hard. I heard his head crack into the cement. I didn't think it was so bad at first until I saw the pool of blood forming beside Tiger's head. Ceres rolled him over and gasped as his mask tilted. I never seen one of those masks even twitch when they're doing the most active of scenes. He'd really been hit hard if it was coming off. Her head shook no repeatedly until the mask finally slid off, landing on the ground with a soft thunk. In the flickering light of the dying street lamp, I saw how unnaturally pale Tiger's face was, how the skin was uncomfortably moist and wrinkled, like how your fingers get when they've been in the water for too long. His eyes were glazed over, pale. Ceres tried to put the mask back on again and again, but it wouldn't stick. It'd just slip off again. Doe threw her head back and screamed at the top of her lungs, joined shortly by Rabbit, the sound truly of anguish and pain. The drunk stumbled away, holding his hands up. I... I didn't hit him that hard. Was all he got out before Ceres pounced. She grabbed him, and with strength I didn't know she had, slammed him into the nearby wall of a closed mom and pop diner. Doe pinned his left arm against the brick, and Rabbit joined her, pinning his right arm. Both women held him still as Ceres picked the mask off the ground. W wait it was an accident. I'm sorry. What are you doing? Put that mask down. Ceresk's mask grinned eerily in the yellowing light as she placed the tiger mask on his face. The drunk screeched in agony as I saw the edges of the mask glow like hot coals and seal to his cheeks and jaw, his knuckles going bone white as his hands clenched. Then he went still. Doe and Rabbit released him and the man stood under his own power, looking at the other masked members of the troop. Rabbit clapped his shoulder, and Doe shook his hand, welcoming him into the ranks. Then, Ceres turned and saw me. The only other person on this empty street. I ran. I ran like hell. I locked the door and hid in my room with a baseball bat, expecting the people I thought were my friends to turn on me for seeing whatever the hell that was. I got a dozen texts from Ceres. None I read. I didn't know what to do. I was half tempted to hightail it back to Grandma's, tell her the job didn't work out and that I needed some help. They came for me last night. Zebra, Doe, and the new tiger. They knocked on the door and waited for me to come out. They didn't barge in. They just knew 
I had nowhere else to go. I didn't resist as they escorted me to one of the motels they tended to take up whenever they stayed in town. No words were spoken, a silence I usually found comforting with the troop, but now felt was choking me. I was afraid. Were they going to kill me? Or would they make me wear a mask too? Ceres was waiting outside the door of room 111. Her head was bowed and she looked like a mess. Her hair tangled and clothes rumpled like she'd slept in them. I imagine if I could see her face, I'd see bags under her eyes. But I wasn't sure if I wanted to see under a mask. She opened the door to the room and I was gestured inside. The door closed behind me, and I saw I wasn't alone. There was a man on the bed, and it took me only a second to remember the man with the king mask. He was much older now, frail, bone thin, with only a few strands of grey hair left on his scalp. The only reason I knew he was alive was because his chest was slowly rising and falling, Come in, Tommy. Sit next to me, please. Other than the screaming from the night tiger died, I never heard one of the troops speak off stage before. Trembling, I walked over to the bed and took a seat. Do you remember me? I nodded before realizing he probably couldn't see me all that well. Yeah, you were the member of the troop my mom talked to. I said. The king laughed, which came out more like a wheeze. You don't remember who she said I was? He asked. I shook my head. No, did she? Think. I did think, and it took a bit of digging, but given how closely I linked that memory with trauma, it took me a minute before I remembered what my mom said when she pushed me towards the king. Here, Tommy, this is your father. I almost couldn't breathe. The king's shaky hand reached over and grabbed mine, squeezing as tightly as he could. You've grown well. By the time we came back to this town, Valerie had already passed on, and you were with a mother. And well, your grandmother never liked me much. Didn't understand why we did what we did, he said. What? I swallowed, my mouth dry. What do you do? Are you... are you even you? To an extent. The king stared up at the ceiling. I changed very much when I became the king, but so did my father. We all do, once we put on our masks and join the show. I squeezed his hand. Am I supposed to put on a mask now? So I don't talk about what I saw? What you did to the drunk that killed Tiger? We needed a replacement. And his body would do. But you're not going to put on any mask, my son. His head slowly turned back to me. And I swear... I saw the corners of the mask's lips turn upwards into a grin. You're going to be a king. You're my only heir. And it's now your responsibility to lead the troop. To wear this mask until the curtains close. I think I can leave whenever I want. Judging by the heart-wrenching wails I'm hearing in the motel room next to mine, my dad just passed away. I think I can leave whenever I want, but this is not something I should be running away from. The show must go on, and it's my duty to make sure it does. It started as a normal day at work. I was working the long shift, and everyone else had already left for the night. I'd been working long enough 
that I wasn't worried about being the last one here. I was in a pretty safe and well-lit area, and the security gate was closed for the night. I don't know why corporate wanted me to stay an extra hour after we closed. I pulled the cash drawer from the register and went about my routine as normal. After making sure everything came out right, I grabbed the keys from the security room to lock the drawer up. I unlocked the door and left it open, and like always, I had a slight moment of panic when I think about the door closing. I chuckled and reassured myself. Even if the door closed, it doesn't lock automatically. There's even a lock on this side of the door. I turned to leave when I heard something crash through the front doors and gate. I grabbed the keys out of the other side of the door and locked this side. I didn't have to worry about flipping the light off. The security room is reinforced and you can't see the light from the outside if the door is closed. I thought someone was breaking in. There are better places to steal from, just a few hundred feet away. I work in one of those furniture rent to own places. We do have some TVs and computers, most of which are in here with me. That was my biggest fear at the time. That someone would break in here to take the more valuable items and find me. I didn't really have to worry about that though. What was in here was far worse than a couple of thieves. I held my breath for fear of being discovered and listened for any noises. While the security room was reinforced, it wasn't soundproofed, and the sounds I heard through the door were very disturbing. It wasn't human. In fact, it didn't sound like any animal I had ever heard in this area. Where I live and work is out in the country, so I know the sounds of the local wildlife. I could hear furniture and appliances being ripped to shreds, and the roar of the mysterious beast chilled me to the core. It sounded like a demon. The tones and shrieks in a single grunt from it were terrifying. I will never forget the sound for as long as I live, which won't be long if it finds me. It busted through the thick wooden doors that led to the back room where I was hiding. I heard the door splinter and explode. Tears fell from my eyes. I was certain that was the end of me. The beast ripped through the back room, and then it came back. I heard it getting closer to me, growling the whole way. It had discovered the security room. It rammed into the door, and it took everything in me to not cry out in fear. It roared in frustration and dragged its claws across the door. Have you ever heard metal scrape across metal? It sounded like that, but a thousand times worse. I covered my ears and cowered in the furthest corner from the door. It was a relief when I heard it move away. I slowly opened the door and paused every time it creaked. Luckily, I don't see it back here with me. I stood, frozen, and took in the damage the creature had inflicted on the back room. The doors were pulled from their hinges, what was left of them anyway. Shards of the doors had impaled the walls across from them. There was wood everywhere, and I couldn't tell if what was scattered around me would even make up the two double doors that used to be there. I couldn't see the front door from where I stood, but I was sure that they had suffered a worse fate. I looked at the extra stock in the back room. It had been completely, utterly demolished. There were a few chair legs and what used to be lamps lying around. Other than that, everything else was a mess of wood, metal, glass and fabric. Nothing was recognisable. It was just piled in the floor haphazardly. I was in shock. We had to destroy furniture before, but... It had always taken multiple people and a lot of effort. What terrified me the most, though, was when I turned back to the security room. Impossibly deep claw marks marred the door. They were twice as wide as the largest bear in the area and higher up than a bear could reach on all fours. The punctures 
stretched all the way from the top of the door to the bottom. I stared, creeping towards the remains of the double doors. I didn't hear the beast anymore. If I could just get to my car, I would be safe. I could leave and get help. That's when I heard it again. It was coming back. I ran to the security room and closed the door as softly and quickly as I could. Why hadn't I called for help yet? Well, I didn't realise I had my phone with me. I usually would leave my phone on my desk, but this time I had put it in my pocket. With a small sigh of relief, I dialed 911. It never rang. I tried again and again and again, but it never went through. I stared at my phone in disbelief. The words displayed there killed any hope I had. No service. There's a... The service at work could be spotty, but I always had enough to make a call, even in the security room. I hear the beast coming back towards me now. It's right outside of the room again, and I can hear it breathing. I think it knows I'm in here. I pray this door holds. My body was sore and chilled from sleeping on the concrete floor. My head pounded from lack of sleep. What little I'd gotten was more from me passing out than from wanting to sleep. I was dazed and disoriented when I came to. I had hoped against hope that this was a nightmare from reading too many no sleep stories before bed. It had happened before. But reality is harsh. I grabbed my phone from where I'd been charging it last night and checked the time. It was after 10am. My next day's shift had already begun. I thought, maybe whatever had been here had left in the night and normalcy had returned. There would of course be questions of how the store got in such a condition. My relief vanished when I came to my senses. My hand was on the lock, about to open the door. I stopped and listened. Silence. I strained my ears to hear anything, anything at all, nothing. It was after 10am. Everyone should have been here by now. Even if they were late, someone would have been here some time after 8. I would have been able to hear their voices, and someone would have noticed the disaster and called the police. They would have called me since I was the last to leave and supposed to have been the first one to arrive. I dared to crack the door open and peek outside. I couldn't hear whatever creature was out there either. This was my chance to escape. If I could get to my car, I could drive to the police station or home. Home seemed like the preferable option. If the police needed me, they could find me. I tiptoed through the empty place where the doors once stood to the main area of the room. If I hadn't been expecting it, I would have been shocked at the devastation. There wasn't so much as a chair left recognisable. What did shock me though, were the large glass windows and security gate. There wasn't any glass left. I could see the shards lying both outside and inside the window. The security gate lay on the opposite side of the room, a couple of hundred feet away from where it had previously been attached to the wall. It was a mangled heap of metal, crumpled from both the impact of the beast and the impact of flying across the room. I rushed into the office to grab my keys so I could make my escape. I stopped suddenly when I saw my car. It had been flipped on its side. I started to move again, intent on taking the work vehicle instead, when I saw that it too had been flipped over. Our work vehicles weren't little cars like mine was. They were vehicles made to deliver furniture and were much heavier than the average personal vehicle. I wasn't going to be able to drive out of here and I sure wasn't going to be walking either. That's when I heard a scream. It started as a horrific sound and changed to one of extreme pain before being cut off. Whoever had been out there was dead. 
and I was no hero. I wanted to live, so I was not going to be running out to save someone else. I did, however, run back to my security room. This thing was hunting people in the area. I would not be an easy meal. It's been a couple of hours since then. I realized that I was not the only one stuck in the area. I wasn't the only one being hunted. I glued myself to the door and strained my ears to listen. Every time I heard a scream or the beast next door, I would move. I have a good little supply heap going at the moment. The break room is right beside the security room and we always kept it stocked. I grabbed some fabric from the destroyed furniture for something soft to sit on. If I sound like I'm brave and adapting well, I'm not. I am absolutely terrified, especially when it comes back. I've realized something else too. When I was looking outside, I didn't see any cars on the highway. It's a pretty major one. There's always traffic and sirens to be heard. The trains behind the store hasn't ran either. It goes by several times a day. There aren't any animals outside. It's all so eerily quiet. When it is in my store, I stay quiet and check for ways to escape. I tried calling over Wi-Fi, but I'm not tech savvy and the internet still won't load. One of the emails I sent went through, but I don't think my friend believed me. It's almost like the boy who cried wolf stories. I got YouTube and Twitter to load and left as many posts and comments as I could, but most people just thought I was trolling. It left again. I can hear it next door. I was able to dial 911 a little while ago. I think they got enough information, but there was so much static I can't be sure. Hello, what is your emergency? I'm trapped at work. There's something outside. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? There is a wild animal at my work. The address is... Beep. I tried again, and I think they got the address this time. I can hear sirens now. The first sounds besides me, the beast, and the screams of its victims. They're getting closer. I think the operator heard me. The car stopped outside of the store, and I dared to open the door and move to look outside. There were three cop cars outside. The officers rushed outside with their guns drawn. That's when I saw it. The beast came into view. It was the size of a bear. And by that, I mean it was the same size on all fours as a large bear standing up. Its shortest claw was longer than my forearm. It looked like a warped bear straight out of someone's worst nightmare. It didn't look natural. It was like someone took parts of great predators and fused them together. I would never forget the look of it. It will haunt my nightmares if I make it out. I watched and listened in silent horror. Gunfire filled the air and the creature roared. Not in pain, but anger. Time seemed to slow as I watched it rip the officers apart. Blood and gore rained everywhere. It was then that it turned and looked at me. Its eyes seemed to smirk at me. I could see them from where I stood. I shuddered with the knowledge that if I saw them closer, I would be at its mercy. Not bothering to remain quiet, I ran back to the security room with a beast on my tail. It was playing with me. There was no way I would have made it back if it hadn't. I slammed and locked the door not feeling any relief. It had always known I was in here, and had only ventured away for easier prey. It threw itself at the door, with the most sickening crunch for what felt like hours. By the time it grew tired of the game, the door was dented inwards. It is still sturdy and holding, but I don't know how much longer that will last. I don't think I actually slept last night. I was afraid of it breaking in during the night. I could hear it breathing outside of the door. It seems to like the challenge that the door holds. I did try to barricade the door with the TV boxes we had been storing in here. It didn't really make me feel much better since they were so easy to move. 
I did climb up on the shelves we had and huddled there for the night. If it had broken in, I might have been out of reach. I tried to call for help again, but all I got was static. Sometime in the night, the sirens from the cars died. I'm not sure I'm brave enough to try go for one of them though. They were all the way on the other side of the four lane highway. I have to wait for it to go on another killing spree, as morbid as that sounds, to even consider it. I'm not sure there are many people other than me left. It's kind of obvious that someone is keeping people out of the area right now. Who knows why they haven't made a rescue attempt yet. My only hope is that someone more heavily armed comes to investigate the missing officers. I'm currently playing a dangerous game. When the creature leaves, I leave. Every time. It's easier to listen for it to leave since I've been straining to listen at every little sound. I've been rummaging through the debris in the back for anything I can use as a weapon. I took some tools and nails and fashioned a better barricade. I would like to be able to keep the creature out of the store altogether, but I'm not foolish enough to attempt it. Instead, I'm focusing on some type of weapon for myself. I took several shards of glass and glued and tied it to the end of a chair leg. I used another piece of glass to sharpen the other end of the leg. I ended up slicing my hand open on it though. I had to run back to the security room because I heard it charging back. He could smell the blood on my hand. I had the newly made barricade in place and it is actually working pretty well. I could hear it sniffing at the door and had to quickly wrap my hand with a spare strip of fabric to be able to hold my weapon. I hope I don't have to use it. If I do, it will be out of desperation. Every time I leave the room, it is with a weapon in hand and phone in my pocket, just in case I'm able to make a go for it. I left the room at the sound of multiple screams and tried to psych myself up for an escape. All three cars were still sitting upright, almost as if the creature wanted me to hope. It clearly has human level intelligence. I still don't know or care what it is. Just as I was contemplating the long run to a car, I saw a brave soul make a go for it. There were still screams coming from down the street, so the monster was distracted. I could have made a run for it too, but I'm glad I waited. The man had a shorter distance because he was on the same side of the road as the cars. I silently cheered him on and waited. He made it to the closed door. The car started to go, and I was excited for him. It was possible to get out. In my excitement, I hadn't realized the screams had stopped, or the sound of a large animal galloping down the highway. I didn't realize until it had caught up to the car and knocked it over. The man hadn't even made it a hundred feet. I watched in horror as the creature pulled the man out and started eating him while he was still alive. I looked up, and I swear to God, it smirked at me. It sauntered off in a different direction, almost like it was daring me to try the same thing as the man. I'm not going to make it to a car, but I might make it to the roof. I was back in the security room with more supplies. I had raided the break room again and had managed to recover my water bottle from the remains of my desk. I had another bottle I'd found and I filled them both to the brim. I found a large patch of fabric that I was able to make into a bag big enough to fit my supplies. I used another strip of fabric to tie my weapon to my waist. The creature was back and banging on the door again. Have you ever been terrified for so long that it just doesn't faze you anymore? I was numb. My focus solely on my task and my spear never far away. I would have to wait until much later to try for the ladder. Did I mention I am usually paralyzed by my fear of heights? I guess in the game of life and death, the other fears take a back seat when trying to survive. Night had fallen when the beast left the store again. I didn't have to strain my hearing anymore. I could hear every move it made clearly. It can probably see in the dark, but there was a chance I was willing to take. I knew where the ladder was from driving around the building 
and taken the trash out multiple times. It was on the furthest side of the building. I waited to open the door until I knew the creature was out of my hearing range, and then a bit more, just to be safe. I eased the door open and made my way as quickly and quietly as I could to the broken windows. There was no point going through the door when there were so many exits now. This was the first time I'd been outside of the store in four days. It was so quiet outside, which meant the beast wasn't hunting. I had to move quickly since I had no idea where it actually was. I had my hand on the ladder when I heard the beast roar. I chanced to glance behind me and saw it rushing at me at full speed. I started climbing as fast as I could, heart beating uncontrollably. There was no denying this was the absolute most terrifying moment of my life and quite possibly the end. I had to have been about 20 feet off the ground when it reached me. I looked down thinking I was out of reach. It was the worst decision of my life. I could see every demented detail of it. It was like Dr. Frankenstein had come back and decided to make a new species. I could see the stitches in its flesh through missing patches of fur which was different lengths and colours. The front of its head ended in a skull. A skull that looked more like an ancient species of wolf than a modern bear. I started moving again when I saw its paws move. The claws were metal. I scurried as fast as I could when I felt a blazing pain swipe through the back of my calf. That leg slipped and I hung there for a moment. A sound, almost like a laugh, came from the beast below me. I moved up again. I put my leg on the next rung, but it couldn't hold me from the damage that had been done. My other leg slipped, and one of my hands. I was holding on for life, praying I didn't fall. It would be over. I struggled for what seemed like forever, trying to get my feet under me. My remaining hands started to slip as well. By some miracle, I managed to get my good leg under me and climbed the rest of the way up. An angered roar echoed below me. At some point, I think I passed out from exhaustion, relief, and blood loss. Mainly blood loss. My leg was shredded to the bone. It was dark and bright at the same time. It took me several moments before I was fully aware of what was occurring. Gunfire sounded all around me, and the light that had woken me was coming from an overhead helicopter. I dragged myself to the edge of the building to see what was going on. Armoured vehicles were everywhere and the beast was surrounded by men in full tactical wear. I watched the beast go down to my relief. It was finally over. I heard footsteps behind me and turned to see a man walking towards me from the rope hanging from the helicopter. It's alright now. It's over. I cried with relief. They wanted me to get in the helicopter, but I refused. I was terrified of heights after all. Stupid fear came back after the beast was down. They nodded and got someone to get me down to the ground. They had a paramedic look at my leg and hand while they questioned me. I told them almost everything. Something was telling me not to tell them what I saw up close. When they asked me if I'd seen it, I told them I had from a distance. It looked like a giant bear. I hadn't looked at it when it clawed me. I was too scared. They believed me. Why not? I'd just been rescued by them. Why would I lie? I don't know why, but the conversation I heard, that should have been out of earshot, made me realise that it was a smart decision on my part. I can't believe you got away from us. It was just a matter of time. It was a good opportunity to study it though. I agree, it's very intelligent. It's a good thing the survivor didn't see it. It's a good thing the survivor didn't see it up close. Heh, <laughs> yeah. We would have had to kill her if she had. Government secrets and all. I stopped listening after that. The less I knew, the better. I was lucky to be alive. And I would take the secret to my grave.
On my seventh birthday, my mother made me a race car cake. She stayed up the previous night until pale sunlight began to filter through the thin white and blue checkered curtains of our small kitchen window. I know this because I drank one too many cups of apple juice at dinner and my bladder could only take so much. I remember how tired she looked when I peered into the kitchen on my way to the bathroom and how all I cared about at the time was that she'd chosen the wrong colour for the frosting. I thought pink and purple were too girly. I don't remember much of my birthday party. Erica Sander tipped a chair so far back that she toppled right over and her mother took her home early, scolding her about safety as she struggled with our barely functional front door. George McCullough showed us how he could snort milk through his nose. I threw a tantrum over the girly colours of my cake. My stepfather demanded that everyone leave early, red in the face, barely holding composure. I woke up in the hospital several hours later, confused, ears ringing, dark bruises on my neck, near one eye, and obscuring both sides of my head. I couldn't hear the doctor's words as he smiled warmly and welcomed me back into consciousness. I couldn't hear my mother's cries, couldn't even hear my own screams. My stepfather moved out several days later. My story begins 14 years after that birthday party. It wasn't too common for head trauma to result in deafness, but I had never been all that lucky. Despite spending two thirds of my life without hearing, I'd never quite adjusted to the lonely life of a deaf introvert. When I walked through the crowded streets of my city, I used to wish I could hear the conversation, the loud cars, the bustle and rushing of businessmen. How foolish I was to wish I could hear it all. The warm glow of the setting sun told me that I had once again lost track of time, wading through endless deadlines and paperwork. I scolded myself for working extra hours, robbing myself of precious moments of gloomy isolation back at my apartment. Finally, on the bus home, I settled my briefcase in my lap and began to map out my evening in my head. It only took a few lurching stops of the bus for me to notice that the small screen that usually displayed the name of the upcoming stop wasn't working. Cursing silently under my breath, I strained my eyes to see through the foggy windows, but it was too blurry for me to make out any familiar shapes. Thinking quickly, I tapped the shoulder of the woman sitting behind me. She turned to look at me, clearly annoyed and I held up a finger to signal her to wait. I hurriedly pulled out a piece of paper and messily scrawled the name of my stop and a short explanation of my situation in the hopes that she could tell me when the driver announced Parkside Drive. When I turned to show her the paper, she had already moved to a new seat. You'd think nearly a decade and a half of being deaf would bring me some experience to deal with a situation like this, but I wasn't good at coping. I sighed and began to count the stops, trying to estimate how many stops I needed to sit through to get to my own. Annoyance bubbled under my skin. Without thinking, I angrily tore the small piece of paper into several pieces, clenching the crumpled bits in my fist. Idiot. I'm sorry, I looked up, irritated, searching for whoever had spoken. I had begun my silent cursing again when it hit me. I had heard. I took a quick glance around, confused, but much to my dismay, everyone around me had gone silent. Was I going mad? I caught a glimpse outside as the door opened and closed. Damn it, I had just missed my stop. It was four o'clock in the morning. I'd spent the past six hours in bed, window wide open, straining to hear any hint of sound. I barely cared that I had to work the next day. I'd gotten a taste of what I'd missed for two thirds of my life, and I wanted more. When a car sped past my building, illuminating my room in a bright white light, I finally got what I'd asked for. What are you waiting for? An answer, I suppose, I replied. My conversation partner did not deliver. 
I tried to rid my sleep-deprived mind of thoughts about what I'd heard. But my morning routine was distracted and messy. I examined myself in the mirror, trying to smooth away any stray shampoo bubbles I'd missed as I'd absentmindedly rinsed my hair. I had half turned away, and something odd caught my eye. Something was not quite right. As I turned back to investigate, I placed a finger on the glary inconsistency. My reflection hadn't moved an inch. I furrowed my brow and raised one hand into the air. My reflection did the same, steadily holding my gaze. Then, he smiled. He waggled his finger at me in a wave. Not even a hello? His voice was a high-pitched giggle. He grinned at me, his smile so wide I thought the tendons in his face might tear apart. I stared back, feeling something between relief and fear. What do you want? My voice was hoarse and shaky from years without use, but I tried to sound as firm as I could. I want what you want. After all, I am you. And what is it that I want? I was nearly too afraid to ask. Just a little justice. Its smile grew wider before it began to fade to match my own expression once more. I took a deep breath and so did my reflection. I slowly backed out of my bathroom and away from the mirror. He was right. I did want justice. It was almost nine o'clock in the morning. I'd emailed my boss to let her know I was sick. I suppose that wasn't really a lie. I was lightheaded and nauseous from my encounter. But I knew what I had to do. My first stop was the hardware store. I picked up a length of rope, but the voice of my reflection corrected me. Duct tape will do better. I haphazardly tossed a roll of duct tape and a crowbar onto the counter. Glancing at the digital numbers displaying my total, I handed the cashier a wad of crumpled bills and headed out with my supplies. Now, go get him. You know he never left the building. My voice directed me onto a bus, and before I knew it, I was headed into an eerily familiar part of the city. The houses grew smaller and shabbier as we went, Lawns losing their perfectly even green to be replaced with overgrown weeds and dead brown grass. Then, even the houses began to dwindle. Towering, dark, damp apartment buildings taking their place. A chill shook me to the bone, and my clammy hands quivered as though they were freezing. The bus let me off, and my heartbeat grew louder and rougher. I walked slowly until my voice commanded me to quicken my pace. The elevator groaned as it ascended, and I felt as though I might groan too. Anxiety racked my bones, but my steps had become sure. Knock. You know his home. I sucked in one deep breath and wrapped my knuckles against the door. What? A gruff voice responded from inside. I didn't dare answer. What? Footsteps pounded angrily, closer and closer. My stepfather yanked the door open, his face a deep shade of red that I remembered all too well. He opened his mouth, taken aback by the sight of the stepson he hadn't seen in nearly 14 years. But before he could speak, I had struck him with a crowbar. He crumpled to the ground, and I nearly didn't recognize the sight of him on the floor. He was weak, arms limp at his side, powerless. I acted quickly, using the duct tape to restrain his arms and legs, placing one final piece over his mouth in the hopes of muffling any screams. I had just finished when my stepfather began to awaken. Impeccable timing, just like in the movies. My reflection began to giggle that high-pitched giggle and all I wanted to do was cover my ears and drown it out. My stepfather's eyes fluttered open, widening suddenly as they met mine. 
He tried to scream, but it was no use. What's the matter, Dad? Cat got your tongue? I spat at him, mimicking the words he'd used to torment me before he left, taunting me as I cowered silently in fear. As he screamed muffled protests, I pulled a knife from my bag and held it to his throat. I'll bet you want me to make it fast, I sneered. Blood pounded in my head, and all I could think of was the sting of his fist against my face. His fingers tight around my wrists as he held me back from escaping. I let the tip of the blade slice into his skin, and his screams got more desperate. I didn't feel guilty as I toyed with him, mutilating his face, slicing out his tongue, removing his ear slowly, painfully. Blood dripped from my hands and from the deep gashes in his skin. I played the scene over and over my head as I rode my bus home. I was almost frightened by the rush I'd gotten as I plunged my knife into his skull, finally finishing the job. I knew I'd get caught. I wasn't careful. I just didn't care. Did he deserve to die? My voice startled me out of thought. I rolled my eyes and ignored it. Did he deserve to die? I was asked again as I entered my apartment. Maybe, maybe not. At the very least, he deserved to pay. I finally responded. So you get to play God? You get to dole out punishments as you see fit? My voice giggled. You told me to do this. You're not so innocent yourself. You're right. I'm not. My voice taunted. I am you. And you are guilty. Guilty of what? Give that piece of crap what he deserved? You killed a man. You killed someone. And you don't feel remorse. I didn't know what to say. I headed to the bathroom to wash the last of his blood from underneath my fingernails. My eyes were drawn to the mirror above the sink. But I regretted looking up before my eyes even met my own. He grinned gleefully as he met my gaze. You're a murderer. You're no better than me. He cackled. I stared back at him. I wanted to scream. I wanted to shout and shake his shoulders and make him understand that I gave my stepfather no less than he deserved. Killer. Killer. His laughs grew higher, wilder, tormenting me as he pointed an accusing finger. What's going on, son? Cat got your tongue? He giggled. He stared me down as he lifted my bloody knife into view. I backed away instinctively, words still on the verge of spilling over my tongue. My reflection stayed put. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. I stared in disbelief as he took his tongue between two fingers and raised the blade against it. My mouth was slightly agape, but I couldn't breathe, couldn't speak. Blood dribbled down his chin and I could hear the droplets fall to the floor as well, as if they were in the same room with me. I slowly lifted my fingers to my own lips, to find that they were wet. Tentatively, I glanced down to find what I had feared. The floor was darkened at my feet with a gathering pool of blood. I opened my mouth, but while I felt a shriek escape my throat, all I could hear was a guttural choking laugh of my reflection. I will never speak again. I've broken every mirror in my apartment. All I can do is sit and wait for the consequences of my crimes to unfold, or at least further consequences. Howdy. You can call me Jack. It's not my real name, but that's what I'll go by for now. I reckon the time to tell you my story has come. Believe it or don't, but here it is. I suggest you take away the lesson it teaches, even if you dismiss it all as BS, like 98% of other stories on the internet. But there's one more truth in this story than any one of you could know. Now, I've been out of high school for three years, but that's when this particular event takes place. So, 
I'm going to have to wind my clock back a little here to tell the story. Originally, for my first two and a half years of high school, I attended a school in the deep southern part of America, close to the Gulf. We had all kinds of ghost stories growing up, and if there was one lesson our super conservative parents taught us, it was this. Don't go fooling around in things you don't understand. Now, I was really unpopular at my high school in the South. My first two years of high school were a real pain because I was a big dork and everyone made fun of me. I was a loner, and all I really did in class was play my Game Boy all day before rushing back to play an MMO I was addicted to. All of that changed during my junior year when my mother's job moved us out west. I started to attend a little Catholic high school with no more than around 250 students. It was at this time that I finally started to fit in and make friends. No one out here knew how much of a dork I was, so I opted to hide my power level, as they tend to say on Slash A, and try to make friends for once in my life. Who knows, maybe I could even get a cute girlfriend if I was careful. I started to meet people at the school. At a school that small, you end up knowing everyone in your class. My first day, I made a new friend named Sam, and at lunch, I opted to sit with him and his friends. He told me all about the other kids at the school, who was most popular, who the jocks were, so on and so forth. He introduced me to his friends too. Jim, a big jovial fellow who tipped the scales at 300 pounds. Boggleman, our table's resident computer nerd and hacker. And Thomas, a musician who played electrical guitar. I also met Stephanie, the school's resident spunky Asian girl. Some of the guys said she could be annoying, but she seemed cool enough. She was into gaming and never messed with any of us. She even seemed to think I was funny, so maybe that's why she started to call me at home after school on some days. Sam told me all kinds of stories about her, like how she used to make snacks for the guys at school, but then sprinkle Viagra all over them or pour laxatives into them so that anyone who ate it would suffer the brunt of a painful and arguably cruel joke. I just chuckled to myself, and politely refused whenever she offered me anything. Then, there was the Rottenbacker. His real name was Jason, but everyone called him Rottenbacker, or the Kraut, because he was a hardcore Nazi. He was an outcast and a loner. No one wanted to be associated with him. Every day, he would wear a red swastika armband to school, just beneath his jacket where the teachers couldn't see. But whenever he'd get hot and slip it off, or whenever he was changing in the locker room, he'd be wearing the armband. Furthermore, on Halloween and on school costume event days, when he knew he could get away with it, Rottenbacker always wore an entire replica of an SS uniform of the Gestapo wear, with a black hat and the long boots. He was a mean and angsty son of a gun. Whenever anyone told a teacher about him, or asked him about that stuff, he'd shout racial or ethnic slurs at them, cuss them out, and yell Heil Hitler. Furthermore, one particular thing that caught my eye was that I couldn't help but notice that Rottenbacker always walked with a slight limp, like he was in pain. Sam told me that somebody once saw him tightening a barbed salise in the locker room, like the ones the Catholic priests wear to punish themselves for their sins. It was a Catholic school, so I, like most people, just assumed at the time that maybe he just wore the salise because he's a devout Christian. It was kind of strange for a hardcore Hitler lover like Rottenbacker, but it was high school, and none of us preferred to think too much about stuff like that. After he got done introducing me to everyone, Sam told me some of the school's old stories, including an urban legend that circulated around Kaylee, a girl that died mysteriously after playing some sort of cell phone game. Sure enough, he could point out the girl in the yearbook to me, and everyone recalled that the police had declared her missing under mysterious circumstances. She was presumed dead almost immediately thereafter. If you asked anyone exactly what happened, no one could tell you a damn thing. They always just said it was because she played the cell phone game. Sam, Stephanie the cute, mischievous Asian, Rottenbacker, the self-torturing Nazi, the cell phone game the police investigation of a teen's disappearance. 
all of these people and events were about to come together to drag me into something in which I wanted no part of. It wouldn't even be over until over two years later that I finally understood how and why everything went down just the way it did. Anyway, the last half of junior year came and went, and the long summer passed us all by in what seemed like a heartbeat. It was finally time to begin our last year of high school. Everyone was back for the new school year, pumped to start the laziest and most fun year of our high school lives. Even Rottenbacker, still limping around the school in that Barb Solis, still spouting his garbage every time someone decided to mess with him. The year started out eerily quiet. Word was that two more cell phone game related disappearances had happened over the summer to one boy and one girl from another high school and that the police were investigating a possible serial killer. According to the paper, the most common link the police had found was that every person who disappeared had received a text message that read, Welcome to the game. None of the text messages have been sent from the same cell phone, so this evidence has been dismissed as circumstantial. For me, things weren't half bad. It was this year when I finally started to open up more as a person. I'd made a good circle of friends who I trusted and I felt more calm about being myself at this point. Gradually, I started to fit in more and more and pretty soon, I was pretty popular in certain circles. Stephanie liked to hang out with me more and more because of how funny she thought my jokes were. Before long, one day, which I still remember as one of the happiest of my life, she came to me in the middle of campus after school and looked up at me with those beautiful eyes and that long, black hair and a smile to die for. She asked me right then, Jack, will you go out with me? I laughed, ran and jumped for joy. Of course I will, I said, and danced around with her there in front of everyone. I finally had a girlfriend. I still remember that as one of the happiest days of my entire life, if not the happiest. We went on dates, we hung out after school, and she even started to eat lunch with Sam, Jim, Fogelman and I every day. Maybe I wouldn't have been so happy had I known what was going to happen next. It was one day at lunch when she was sitting with us and she mentioned that while sleeping over with her friend one night, they'd stayed up late with some girls from another high school talking about the cell phone game. She said that these girls knew about the rules of the game and that they had explained it to her in great detail. Supposedly, you can join the game at any time by sending a text message at midnight to the right phone number. The text message was supposed to say, I wish for the power to curse. If you did it right, you would get a message in return that said, Welcome to the game. And supposedly, this was the reason they had given for why the police found that message on the phones of everyone that had disappeared. Stephanie went on to talk about the game, we all listened attentively to what she was saying. She told us that once someone was in the game, they were in danger. Within two weeks, they had to complete one of a number of different tasks or they would be dragged away in the night. I stopped her right there. Dragged away? By what? To where? She got silent for a moment. I don't know she whispered, before continuing her story. She said that in order to protect oneself from being dragged away, you could do one of two things. The first was to find a special protective item. The item could be anything. You never knew what it was going to be, but it seemed that whatever the item was, it would make the bearer suffer in some way. This was considered a small price to pay in return for protection for as long as you wore the item. The second way was to bring someone else into the game. This could be done by sending the text message, Welcome to the game, to someone else's phone. If someone received the text message from someone else who was in the game, then that meant that this person was now in the game too, and subject to all of the same rules and consequences of the game. 
If the person didn't find a protective item themselves or bring another person into the game, then they too would be dragged away. The catch about the second was this. While the protective item, if found, could protect you indefinitely so as long as you kept it with you, bringing someone else into the game would only buy you a temporary grace period. The first time you brought someone into the game, you'd get a two-week extension. Then, only one week. Then, only one week. Eventually, the grace period would get shorter and shorter until you barely bought yourself any time at all by bringing someone else into the game. By that time, you needed to have found your protective item. Even though I've always been something of an X-File, I didn't like hearing her talk about this stuff, so I told her it was a bunch of nonsense. You really think so? She asked. If it's true, it would explain what the police found, and imagine how cool that would be to be able to curse anyone who messes with you by bringing them into the game. You could get rid of anyone, and no one would ever know. There was an edge in her voice I'd never heard before from Stephanie. She almost sounded intoxicated at the thought of it. Truth be told, it scared me a little. Don't go talking like that, I told her. Stuff like that's beyond people like you and me. You shouldn't go messing around with stuff like that. What if you got involved in it, and then it all turned out to be true? What would I do if something happened to you? Promise me you won't go messing around with that stuff. She gave me a funny look. I never thought you would be the kind of person to be scared of silly stuff like this, Jack. Well, I don't think it's right to mess around in stuff you don't understand, you know. I gave her a concerned look. Now promise me, Steph. Promise you won't go try it. She sighed in annoyance. Fine, fine. I won't play the scary cell phone game. Are you happy now? I told her I was. But truth be told, I was scared. I didn't believe her. In all the time I'd known her, I had never seen her betray anyone or sleep around or anything, but she had always been a trickster and a liar and would lie to anyone about anything if it got her ahead without hurting anyone else. But to be honest, I always thought that it was kind of cute and just accepted it as one of her quirks. But this time, it was serious. So, a few days later, when she came back and told us that she had joined the cell phone game, I was mad. What are you thinking, Stephanie? You promised me you wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, I know. But it's not any big deal. I've already got it all planned out. Besides, if it's true and it works, it's too good of an opportunity to pass up. She held up her phone. Look, she said giddily. Her text message was open on the screen, which read, Welcome to the game. Kind of freaky, huh? I got it just after I sent a text at midnight, just like the girl said. My jaw dropped. I was speechless and scared stiff. This game couldn't be for real, could it? Stephanie, if this is real, then you're in danger now. You've only got two weeks to find the protective item. I know. That's why I sent the text message to Rebecca. I'm going to find out if it's true or not. I hit the roof. You did what? But Stephanie, if this is real, then that makes you as good as a murderer. You cursed Rebecca, and now she could die because of you. Relax, Jack. I don't actually believe in any of this stuff. But even if I did, Rebecca's always been a big-time ass. It's not like she doesn't have it coming anyway. She giggled that same mischievous giggle of hers that I'd always loved. But this time, I wasn't loving any part of it. A couple of weeks passed, and nothing happened. But then, one day, Rebecca didn't show up at school. At lunchtime, Stephanie was sitting around with us as usual, when the assistant principal came to talk to us all with a megaphone. May I have your attention, please? Everyone got silent. The police have reported that one of your fellow students, Rebecca, has gone missing. Stephanie's golden skin turned white. She froze. Her parents are very worried about her. If any of you know anything about this, please come and talk to me after school. That is all. 
Stephanie, I whispered. I was very afraid for her. I was very afraid for what she might do. She looked at me and said, Don't say anything. Just don't. She got up and bolted from the lunchroom. I chased after her. Stephanie? Stephanie, what are you doing? She kept jogging away from me, her cell phone out. Don't try to stop me, Jack. If I'm going to survive, I'm going to need more time. I can get another week if I curse someone else, and that'll give me three weeks to find it. Stephanie, listen to yourself. Who are you going to curse? You'd kill someone else for a little extra time? Look what's happened to you. She was starting to cry. I know, damn it, but I know who I'm going to curse. No one's going to miss them, I promise. Stephanie, that's not right. You can't do it. No one deserves this. Let me help you. We can find a protective object for you together. She turned and showed me her cell phone. Her text outbox had a message which read, Welcome to the game. She had sent it to Rottenbacker. I started to weep. I grabbed onto her tightly as I could. Stephanie, Stephanie, I love you. I'm so sorry. This isn't right. None of this is right. She held on to me and began to cry deeply as well. We held each other there for nearly an hour like that. I still remember it like it was yesterday. Then, that night before we went home, we both resolved we would start looking for a protective item the next day. The next day, I was walking with Stephanie along the track after school when Rottenbacker approached us with his cell phone. He was furious. He held it up to her face. Is this your idea of a joke? He said, followed by some racial slurs. Truth be told, I felt Roddenbacker had the right to be a little angry. Sure, he was a natty pervert freak, but with all the whispers of murder going around, I couldn't imagine anyone being angry about getting a text like that. But even so, I wasn't about to let anyone talk to my girl that way. Hey buddy, watch your mouth. There's no way to talk to a lady. Lady? Roddenbacker shouted. This whore's not a lady. She's an ass, and she tried to kill me. I bet you killed that other girl too, didn't you? Rebecca. She's missing because of you, isn't she? Stephanie began to cry. I pulled my arm back and punched as hard as I could at Roddenbacker's face. He stumbled backwards a few steps and grabbed his lip, from which trickled a little stream of blood. But he kept his composure. I halfway expected him to swing back at me, but he just stood there. After a moment, he spoke. You don't get it, do you, Stephanie? I'm already in the game. I always have been. You know the score. But unlike you, I never cursed anyone else. Bullcrap, I said. If that's all true, then how are you still... Suddenly, I remember the Solis rotten back a war around his leg that caused him to limp in agony and what Stephanie had told me at lunch. Whenever a new protective item was discovered, whatever it was, it would cause its bearer to suffer. Your protective item? You have one? Stephanie's eyes lit up. It was clear that she had realised the same thing that I had. Rottenbacker smirked. That's right. So I just figured your girlfriend better know that she didn't get any additional time for trying to curse me. I've already been there and done that. Stephanie looked up at him with fear in her eyes. Days passed, and, try as we might, Stephanie and I couldn't find anything that could qualify as a protective item. We were approaching the two-week deadline, and she was looking more and more scared by the day. Her hair was a mess. Her usual bubbly personality was glum and distraught. She stared off into space during classes and prayed constantly. After the two-week deadline passed, we were both terrified. She came to me at school and said, Jack, I want you to sleep with me tonight. Stay with me all night. Don't let it get me. I couldn't refuse. I showed up at her house late that night and came in through a window. We slept together. It was bittersweet. 
she went to sleep holding me. But I lay awake most of the night, watching and waiting, until I finally fell asleep around 4.30 in the morning from sheer exhaustion. The next day, when I woke up, all I could think was, Stephanie! I looked around frantically. She wasn't in the bed next to me. Stephanie! I said louder as I climbed out of bed and began to search for her. I walked into her kitchen. Don't be so loud, her voice said. It was Stephanie's. I turned around to see her sitting at a round table in the kitchen. She was smiling and seemed as giddy as ever. I breathed a sigh of relief. My parents have already gone to work, but I don't want the neighbours to get suspicious and say something. I wept with relief. It was over, and she was safe. Nothing had come for her. I ran across the kitchen floor and hugged her and kissed her all over. Everything was perfect. For two weeks. Then, I came to school one day, and nine of her classmates had disappeared, including Sam. Everyone was in uproar. No one knew what had happened to them, or where they had gone. No one, except for me, and the person who had done it. Stephanie. If the amount of time extended was halved each time you brought someone into the game, the nine people would have brought her just over two weeks, which meant that her time would be running out again tonight. I confronted her about it after school. Stephanie, the police are getting serious. You can't do this anymore, and I can't watch you do this anymore. It's wrong. It's evil. She looked at me, silently. I still remember the look in her eyes that day. At this point, it had become clear to me that the girl I had known and loved was long gone, and what remained was a soulless, wicked shell which clung to life and feared death more than anything. But, even so, I still loved her more than anything. She was my first and only girlfriend, and I couldn't let her go. I couldn't let anything happen to her. It's okay, she said. I won't do it anymore. I've accepted what I need to do, and I'm going to do it. No one else is going to die because of me. Stephanie, are you sure? Maybe we can still find a protective item for you if we look now. She looked down, sadly. There's no use in running from it now. I just want to spend the night with you tonight, okay? One more night together. That's all I ask. I was heartbroken. Everything was too melancholic and too melodramatic. I was so sad at hearing her words, at the thought of her being taken away. I threw up. I vomited and retched over and over again into a nearby garbage can, trying to fight back the endless stream of tears. That night, she slept with me again. Sick, weak and tired, I passed out from pure exhaustion at 3am. Less than an hour later though, I awoke with a start. Stephanie was gone. I sat up and looked around in terror, then found a note. I read it. Jack, I'm sorry for lying to you again, but I'm not ready to die yet. A chill went down my spine. I continued to read. I figured out what I need to do. Don't worry, as I promised, no one else is going to die because of me. What could she be thinking? I looked around my room. Suddenly, I noticed that the 45 caliber my father had bought for me for my 18th birthday was missing from my room. And everything made perfect sense. That's why she wanted to spend the night with me tonight. She wanted my gun. She was planning to go after Rottenbacker and take his protective item. As fast as I could, I threw on some clothes and bolted from my truck. I sped off towards Rottenbacker's apartment. When I got there, the lock had been shot off and there were voices inside. I pushed the door open. What's going on here? I demanded. I looked around. 
Stephanie was holding Rottenbacker at gunpoint with my 45. The apartment walls were covered in pictures of Hitler and swastika banners. There were whips and chains scattered around the bedroom floor. Rottenbacker was stomping around in long sleeved pajamas and cursing at her in his typical neo Nazi form, screaming at her about home invasion and calling the police and this and that. He was even wearing a stupid armband. It was obvious this guy was a lunatic fanatic. Stephanie screamed at him. Shut the hell up! She fired around at the wall behind him and winced. I remember my ear ringing from the loudness of the gunshot and a sharp pain in my inner ear, but I was too tense to worry about it at the moment. Now, give me that barbed torture thing you're always wearing or I'll kill you right now. Her voice was all malice. Rottenbacker stood in place for a moment and slowly began to remove his pajama leggings. You're making a big mistake, he said. You should just accept the way things are and die with dignity. You're not going to get away with this. He removed the salise from his leg, from which trickled a small amount of blood, and handed it to her. Immediately, she slipped it onto her leg with one hand, fumbling with my pistol as she tightened it until it hurt, and her own leg began to bleed a little. Let's go, Jack, she whispered and turned to leave. I started to walk out with her. From the apartment, I heard Rottenbacker shouting, You won't get away with this. He's going to come for you, and he's going to drag you off to hell for what you've done. You're going to pay for all those kids. I could see that she was sobbing a little as we walked away. I was sick. I was disgusted with everything. I was disgusted with Stephanie for being so cruel and selfish, and I was disgusted for myself for seeing all of this, and seeing the signs, and not doing anything to stop it. But at least now, it would be over. As we walked back to my truck, I said a small prayer for Rottenbacker, in the hopes that he could find a new protective item within two weeks. He may have been a racist bugger, but in a way, he was still better than Stephanie, if what he said about never cursing anyone else was true, and he didn't deserve to die just for that. I drove Stephanie home. She was exhausted. I would have given her a kiss on the cheek, but I was too sick and just wanted the whole ordeal to be over. Good night, I whispered to her. Good night, Jack. I love you, she whispered back and climbed out of my truck and went back to her house. I started to drive home, exhausted from the day's events. Suddenly, my cell phone began to vibrate. I picked it up. It was a call from Stephanie. I answered. Hello? The first thing I heard was a shriek, followed by what sounded like the noise of pounding at a door. Jack, help! He's here! He's here, and he's coming for me. What? Oh, hold on, Steph. I pulled a U-turn in my truck and sped off back towards her home. Stephanie was becoming more frantic. Suddenly, on the other end of the line, I heard the sound of a door being bashed in, followed by another shriek. I could hear Stephanie screaming at the top of her lungs, a hideous, blood-curdling scream. I still remember every moment of it perfectly, and I remember her screams word for word. No, no, I don't want to die. Adrenaline surged through my heart, and I floored the accelerator. No, 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 stop. She screamed again, and I heard what sounded like the phone hitting the floor, and Stephanie's scream getting further and further away. And then, dead air. Stephanie? Stephanie, answer me, damn it. Getting no response, I hung up and called the police. When I arrived at Stephanie's house, the front door had been smashed in. I parked my car on the lawn and jumped out, carrying my 45 caliber pistol with me. I ran inside, searching the halls. Everything was in slow motion. Then I came to Stephanie's bedroom. I turned on the light and checked all the corners with my pistol leading the way. At length, I lowered the gun as something caught my eye. In the center of the room, Stephanie's cell phone lay on the floor next to her bed. 
In the middle of the room, in the carpet, was a very small patch of blood. It wasn't more than a few drops, but the most chilling sight of all was that, from the edge of a bed to the door of a room which led out into the hall, was a trail of claw marks that she had left as something or someone had dragged her away to a doom. I went out into the street and threw up again. I could hear the sirens coming in the distance. Days passed, then weeks, then months. The police did investigations. They questioned me time and time again, and every time my stories were all the same. I told them the truth as I knew it, as unbelievable as it was. I don't think they believed me, but all of the evidence supported my story and there was nothing to implicate me in any of the crimes. So at length, they finally let me go. Things gradually went back to normal. Our class eventually recovered from the losses of so many of our classmates, and over time, my mind kind of accepted what had happened, until it seemed like a distant dream. I graduated and moved on to college. But there was one thing that still bothered me through it all. And that was Rottenbacker. He had been exactly right. Even though Stephanie had taken his release, he never vanished in the way that she and the others did. But there is one thing that I do know, and that is, to this very day, if you ever see Rottenbacker, he's still always wearing that red Nazi swastika armband. I've always preferred the concrete jungle over the real forests. Some people might feel turned off by the idea of being surrounded by stone, squeezed in with millions of other people, seeing nothing of nature except the occasional tree or weed growing through the cracks in the cement sidewalks. I find being surrounded by the creations of mankind far more soothing than being in the woods. A forest in my eyes is like a giant stomach. Living things go in, they die, and are broken down into food for the rest of the earth. I know this is an extreme view, but I can't help feeling how I feel. That's why, when I was transferred to a small town in upstate New York from my cushy office in downtown Manhattan, I was less than thrilled. While it was nice upgrading from a one-bedroom apartment to a whole house, the fact that the house was surrounded by trees and it took a 15-minute drive until I saw even the barest sign of a neighborhood made me very uncomfortable. But I knew that I had to do this if I had any ambition in climbing up my career ladder, so I had to just grin and bear it. The house wasn't too bad. It was an old Victorian style, like many of the houses anywhere near it, but it was outfitted with many modern comforts. The company was renting it for me, and I only had to stay there for around five months, but I was glad those five months were going to be spent in some comfort. The worst part was learning to go to sleep. I'm used to the background noise, but the almost complete silence of not only the house, but the surrounding woods was jarring. It took me at least a week before I finally got a good night's rest. Slowly, like getting used to the silence, I also got used to being surrounded by the forest. For the first week, I wouldn't go near any of the trees at all. Time went by, and I got more used to my surroundings. After about two months of acclimation, I found my unease subsiding, and I began to even start taking walks in the woods around me. The smells were far more appealing than the typical smell of the city, and the wildlife I saw were quite charming. I even took up some casual bird watching as a hobby. It was in the fourth month there that I began to notice them. It first happened when I was taking a deeper than usual walk into the forest. I just decided I'd gone far enough and turned around to head back home. In front of me, on a large pine tree I had used as the turning back point was a clear chalk outline on the trunk. It was a very basic outline, and small as well. 
so it had to have been the framework of a child. It was like a kid had pressed themselves against the trunk, fingers splayed, and someone had intricately drawn each tiny detail. There was no real trail that led here, and there were no signs that anyone else beside me had ever been there. I looked at the outline, puzzling in my head a moment why it would be there. I thought that maybe the last people who had rented the house had had kids, and maybe they had gone here and done this. I decided that must have been it, and then continued my way back home. It was a bit unsettling at how fresh the drawing seemed, but it hadn't rained since before I even moved into the house, so I thought that maybe that's how it stayed so new. It was only a few days before I found the time to take another walk in the woods. This time, it was a different direction from my last walk. I had gotten maybe half a mile into the trees, when on a large ash tree, I spotted another chalk outline. This one was just as detailed as the first one, with only slight changes. It was a little bit taller than the first one, and the outline looked like the child was wearing a dress. I went to take a closer look, when a rustling sound behind me made me stop and turn around. There. There was nothing there. And when I turned around to face the chalk outline again, I jumped a little in surprise. One of the arms, which I could have sworn was down at the side, was now raised up. It made the chalk outline look like it had been in the process of waving. I stared at the thing in confusion, as I was sure that the arms had both been down at its side. While I wasn't scared or anything like that, I decided that even if my brain had just played a trick on itself, this situation was getting a little creepy, and I didn't want to get any closer to the thing. Sure, if there were two kids the previous renters had, there could be two chalk outlines. But this was just too weird for me. I turned around and went straight home from there. That night, in place of the usual silence of the woods, the weather decided to have a lot of wind. Having gotten used to the silence, the sudden noise was very nerve-shattering. Every time the wind would howl and cause the trees of the house to creak, my eyes would pop open of their own volition and look around my bedroom. Eventually, I got so tired that even those noises didn't startle me out of slumbering. But before I finally drifted off to an undisturbed sleep, I swore I could hear children's giggling hidden within the wind. The next few days passed by uneventfully, and when the skies finally opened up, I decided to go for a walk in the woods during the rain. It was very relaxing, and something I had never really experienced before. The squishing of the wet ground under my boots, the smell of the ozone mixed with the natural smell of the trees, and the sounds of the raindrops as they collided with leaves and branches and puddles was very euphoric. While I hadn't planned to go far into the woods, I lost track of time, and wandered a little further than I expected. All that jubilation vanished as I stepped into a little clearing and caught sight of the trees around me. On seven trees in front of me, forming a semicircle around me, were different chalk outlines. All of them were different sizes of children, even more detailed than the ones I'd seen before. These outlines while they didn't have any facial or body features, had their clothing filled in with different coloured chalk. Some wore shorts and t-shirts, and some had dresses. All the clothing different styles and colours. That wasn't the creepiest thing about them, though. I could clearly see the rain splash onto their lines, from head to toe. And yet, there was no smudging whatsoever. This was when fear began creeping into my heart, and though the chalk outlines were all in a neutral stance, an aura of menace seemed to radiate from them. Their blank faces seemed to be staring at me in an accusatory tone, like I had done or discovered something that I shouldn't have. Their gazes kept me frozen in my tracks, and it wasn't the coldness of the rain that caused the shiver up my back. I took a few steps backwards, 
and then turned and sprinted as fast as my rain boots would allow me back to the house. That night, as I was trying to get some sleep, noises began disturbing all over my house. Downstairs, I could hear certain walls creaking, like something large was pressing itself into the sides of my house. The moment I got out of bed to investigate, however, all sounds ceased completely. Unnerved, I got back into bed and tried to go back to sleep. Whatever was out there wasn't done with me, though. The tapping began soon after, almost unnoticeable at first. It came from downstairs, from the same areas the creaking had started, but this time, it didn't stop when I got out of bed. Slowly, the tapping became louder, as if a whole crowd of people were outside, knocking on my wall. Blended in with the tapping, I swore I could also hear the whispers of children. I could not make out any word, but their tone suggested they were up to no good, and I did not want to find out what mischief they were concocting. I stayed awake in my room, with the door locked and a dresser pushed in front of it, until the light of dawn streaked through my window, and the tapping finally faded out. Very slowly, I unblocked my door and checked out the inside of the house. Nothing inside the house seemed disturbed. There was no sign of entry, and all the doors and windows were still locked. Gathering up the courage to step outside, I found that the outside walls were a different story. There wasn't any physical damage, but all of the outside walls were covered with the chalk outlines of children. They were all as detailed as the seven I'd seen in the clearing, but there was far more than seven. More like fifty or sixty. Many seemed like they were piled on top of one another, as if they were climbing and fighting one another to get somewhere and it was very obvious where they were trying to get to. My downstairs window. A few of them even managed to get their fingers on the sills, hanging on in poses like they were trying to pull themselves up and through them. The worst thing, however, was that one more detail had been added to the outlines. Smiles. All of them were smiling, and not in a happy innocent way. I moved out that very day. I spent the rest of my time upstate in a motel room at my own expense. The only time I left was for work or to buy groceries. I finally felt safe again on my car ride back to Manhattan, even managing to crack a smile. The smile vanished when I offered to pay for the cleanup of the outside of the house to get rid of all the chalk outlines, and my boss gave me a confused look. He told me that the caretaker had dropped by after I left and emailed my boss that the inside and outside of the house were spotless and to thank me for taking such great care of the place. To this day, even on the brightest of days and on the busiest of roads, I cross the street, I cross the street when I see chalk drawings on the sidewalk, drawn by smiling, giggling children. <laughs>